Yeah, it's always interesting to look at those extreme weather events. That was from July 2018. And welcome to our newest supporter, Storm Chasing Germany. Yeah, by the way, we have a few maps here that you might want to check out. This is the surface analysis for that event. And you can see that large area of 110 degree readings. But if you go to the top right of the chart, you can kind of make out a front being driven by convection back over southwest Arkansas. Now, it's very hard to pick out that front. If we go to the SPC Divergence and Vorticity product, you can really see that boundary there from Shreveport northwest up to the Red River Valley. So that's just another tool you can use when you're preparing your mesoanalysis. All right, fast forward to May 2020. What do we got going on? Well, we do have southerly flow out of the Gulf, but the moisture is on the weak side. Our 60s are just right up to the Gulf Coast and inland, lots of 40s and 50s. So we haven't really had much time for the return moisture to build up. And we can see to the north in the Dakotas and Wyoming, new cold front coming down. In fact, it looks like that might hook into that low in Vegas, which is probably partly a heat low, but we'll check that out anyway, since we did have a front yesterday in this area, so I think that might be Bear Clinic. And there's the thickness overlay in red. So yeah, there's a, definitely a front coming through the Northern Plains and also Las Vegas, that is going to be a Bear Clinic system. And let's see, warm front. Yeah, there, it looks like there's a warm front right in there in Iowa. So warm air advection across the Great Plains and on the East Coast. That slow-moving occluded system is out over New Jersey. The cold pool over the Carolinas and the cold front well offshore. So that's the kind of workup I do before I go into the surface analysis. I know sometimes it looks like I just go blind and draw out the fronts and everything, but that's not really the best way to do this. You do want to kind of integrate that with some of your other products, and that's what I've done here. So the front is moving through Nebraska, moving into the Denver area, and the trailing end into the Vegas area. And you can see the northerly winds and the cool temperatures in the high desert of Nevada. South of that frontal system, lots of 90s in Arizona, all the way back into El Paso. And then out in Texas, we can see the start of a dry line. There it is right there. This is day one of the developing dry line, and we should see it get a lot more well-defined tomorrow. Now, if you want to improve your skills on trying to find the dry line, one of my books does go into detail on that. And I've put a lot of information here on how to find the dry line. This is in severe thunderstorm forecasting. So you can freeze frame the video there and read some of the information on how to find the dry line. That's at uh, weathergraphics.com and also my weather analysis and forecasting book also does have some information on that. And moving up into Kansas, we do have a trough that's associated with this heat low here. That would be about from the Russell area down to Gage and south of Amarillo. And you can see the air mass north of that is pretty warm. So that's not a front. A lot of beginners will see that and they'll think that that's the leading edge of this front coming down from the northern plains and that's not the case. You have to go by those temperatures. Obviously 90 and 89 is not a polar air mass, but 84, 76, 73, 68, yeah, that is going to be your transition there. So these winds here, those are mostly in response to the very strong heating in Oklahoma and that 97 there near Pampa. There's how things look in the southeastern U.S. The important thing is the ridge axis. This is the old polar air that came out of Canada a few days ago, and the ridge axis is right there. Everywhere east of there is fresh polar air coming in from the north. And then on the west side, moist air coming in with 50s and lower 60s dew points. And we'll just pan down to southern Florida. Much cooler, low to mid 80s in that area. And the dew points are 
a lot lower down in the 50s. Here's the northeastern U.S. and Great Lakes. There's the ridge axis extending up to Canada. That's the latest polar air coming south, and there's those northwest winds in New York and Pennsylvania. And if we pan to the east, you can see that little outgoing system there around Boston. I don't have a good handle on the extent of that front out into the Atlantic. There's kind of a lot to cover, so we're not going to go into too much detail on that. And then further out west, here's our new system coming out of the Dakotas. And one thing that's very noticeable is the temperature contrast along the warm front. If you draw a line from Kansas City to Minneapolis, you can see how temperatures stay at about 77 all the way to Des Moines, and then they fall off to 73 and 66 there. So that right there, that's the transition zone for sure. And then the northwestern U.S., that is in transition. We got the bulk of that air mass from the Pacific coming in through the northern Rocky region, and that's given us our westerly flow there in Alberta and Montana. And just off the edge of the chart, I can see our next system. There's not enough detail out there to figure out what's going on, but uh, that does look like a warm air advection zone. So I might start looking for a warm front to show up along the Oregon coast here over the next day or two. And there's how things are looking in Europe. Looks like our little wedge of warm air has moved to southern Poland right in here. Still looks like a stationary front draped across northern Italy down into the western Mediterranean and a series of occlusions up north. I guess we can compare that to the British Met Office chart. It's a little bit, uh, we're kind of in the ballpark there. They've got a series of occlusions all the way up there into Norway and Sweden. And let's check out the German analysis. And it's similar. There are some differences with the UK chart. I would probably disagree with this being a stationary front there in the Baltics. Uh, because if there's warm air down here and it's detached from cold air up here, we're going to have to have an occlusion up in this region here. So there are some differences. It's got Spain there in the tropical sector. So I might be inclined to kind of change that, maybe bring the cold front back here. I think this is all cool air, though, so I'm not too sure about that other analysis. But that's the process of diagnosis and analysis. You kind of compare and integrate other products until you get a consistent mental picture of what's happening. All right, let's run through our forecast. Well, I looked at this and saw Friday, and I thought this was today, and I was like, man, I really messed something up. No, um, that's today. It's definitely a lot more boring. So let's do our fronts here. Okay, pretty cut and dry. Cold air advection in the northern plains and in the Great Basin region, and warm air advection out in the Great Plains. We've already gone over all that. And then, of course, the cold pool and showery weather across the Carolinas. So we can use our imagination to picture what we're going to see tomorrow. We're going to expect that cold front to kind of roll out into the central plains. The east coast system will be gone and this chunk of cold air will probably move more into the Great Basin region. And there's how we're looking for Saturday evening. Looks like this uh, high pressure in Nebraska has become kind of dominant, and it's shoved that front into the Amarillo in La Junta and Colorado Springs area. Looks like the system has also broken up out east. We've got this Great Lake system moving east, and then our east coast system is out of the picture. Looks like a little bit of a Bermuda high down there in Florida. It's bringing tropical air right up into Louisiana and Texas. So there's the picture on Sunday. The Hudson Bay vortex looks like it's having another go there. This is big high pressure, and it's driving more cold air into the Great Lakes and northeast U.S. 
Our front in the Great Plains has become stationary down in the Red River and around Amarillo, and so we, we're getting some upslope flow in Colorado, helping to support these storms here in the Nebraska Panhandle and near Cheyenne. Also, we're seeing this front there that's kind of stationary in Utah and Nevada. Lots of cold air in the Washington, Oregon area, and that's supporting that boundary there. And the Gulf is still open. There it is. So here's what I'm seeing for Monday. Still active in the Central Plains. The Pacific system has cleared most of Colorado and the Four Corners area, edging into New Mexico and western Kansas. Warm front is lifting north into northern Oklahoma there, and looks like the dry line is becoming active around Childress and Ampline. And for Tuesday, big high pressure area up in the Canadian prairies, and you can see this ridging coming all the way down into Kansas. So this is all big cold air mass on its way south, and it's driving that cold front down to Interstate 30 and Interstate 20. For Wednesday, the big high pressure area moves into the central U.S., and that's going to clear out a lot of the moist air, and you can see the Gulf is shut down for all but the Rio Grande Valley. A little bit of warm, a little bit of return flow there on the high plains, and looks like another chunk of Pacific air sneaking inland there. That looks to be the fronts. Looks pretty active in Idaho and Montana. Looks like some snow there around Kalispell. Out east, there's a tail end of that front there moving through the Carolinas. And let's see how things look for Thursday. Pretty good pressure gradient there in the Rockies. So it's going to be kind of gusty. A little north wind there of the boundary down into the Four Corners area. And the Gulf is starting to open up a little bit there in Texas. Maybe the dry line is starting to come together. Then looks like some elevated upslope type convection in Kansas and Nebraska. And a pretty good chunk of cold air there in Ontario. Giving us the never-ending relentless winter of May 2020 in the of spring 2020 in the Northeast. And then a week from now, more wintry weather, just more cold air coming into the Great Lakes region. And that's going to drive the front all the way through Texas, clear out the moisture. Old man winter, winter added again, cold front all the way down to Mexico. This is a neat little Alberta clipper system there. And I think we'll probably stop there. I don't want to make this too dry and boring, but it does look like a lot more cold air coming south, and it's going to be a struggle to keep the Gulf open for the first week or two of May. The Climate Prediction Center outlooks for the next 10 days, you can see it's showing definitely cold across the northeast U.S. The one-month outlook for May, cold in the northeast, warm in Arizona, New Mexico. Let's go out to three months. Looks like it's a little bit uncertain in the northern plains, but uh, we do see a higher than normal probability of precip in the Midwest and the Southeast U.S. And looks like maybe a drought starting up in the Pacific Northwest. And as you can see here, things look pretty quiet at SPC. Very poor prospects for severe weather. So it is the weekend coming up, and that's going to be the supporter-only stream. So our Patreon supporters will have private access to the videos. And I'm not sure which day we're going to do that uh, because things are so quiet. See, Saturday there's not very much going on. Looks like some upslope stuff on in Colorado for... Saturday, then Sunday, looks looks like the stuff in Nebraska is going to be mostly elevated since all this is cold air here. And let's see how things look on Monday. Yeah, probably a better chance of severe weather. I think the 
dry line is going to be active. So we're probably going to do our Patreon only stream on Monday. That'll be the plan. And then we'll be back to normal broadcasting on Tuesday. Now, as we get deeper into severe weather season, we'll probably have two supporter only streams on the weekend, but we're just not there yet. So I'll let you see this panel here. This is kind of the chronology of the production for today. You can see we started at 2.42 on the first segment and we're wrapping up at 4.30. So it's almost two hours to record all that. So we're looking at about two hours for production and there's about half an hour for research, 45 minutes for rendering, 45 for upload and about 45 for the drone work. So it really adds up to a big chunk of the day. So if you enjoy these webcasts, it's very important that we get your support. And we have to be pragmatic and focus on what pays the bills. So if you enjoy these videos, it's very important that we have your support. So if you want to support the videos, I'll pop up this link here. Or if you don't see the link, you can just go to this URL. And that'll take you to Patreon. And once you're all set up, you will get access to those supporter only videos. And that's about all I got for today. Hope you all enjoy your weekend. Take care and we will see you either Monday or Tuesday. Bye-bye.